prophet Elijah. Uh, last week we took a, a pause in the action for Father's Day. Um, we're picking back up again with Elijah. And we come to what for me is one of the most... Um, powerful pieces of scripture in the Bible. One of the, one of the real um, benchmarks, I would think, in terms of, of God's uh, power seen by a people that um, had gone away. So we're going to look at 1 Kings 18, verses 16 through 46. I'm going to open your pew Bible up. We're going to be in there. Let's take a look at God's word with me as I read it for you. 1 Kings 18, verses 16 through 46. It says, Obadiah, and Obadiah was a servant of Ahab, the evil king, who led the people into idol worship uh, of Baal. And, um, but Obadiah worked in Ahab's um, uh, castle, and he was faithful to God. And Elijah comes to him first, and he brings Elijah to Ahab. So 1 Kings 18, 16 through 46 So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now Jezebel is the wife of Ahab. She's the one who really led the people into idol worship. She's the one in the video who's all angry and you know, saying, we're going to get you. Um, that's Jezebel, the wife of Ahab. She was a princess of a foreign country that Ahab married into for political reasons. And she really did pretty much run... Um, the stance of Israel uh, as, as his wife. It says, verse 20, it says, So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and he said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose one for themselves. Let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood and not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, He is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. You call Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and presented it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered and they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. It's not enough that it's not working for them. We actually, I mean, Elijah's doing all this stuff we tell our kids not to do, you know? But he began to tease them and taunt them. Verse 27, Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. And they came to him, and he prepared, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. It was in ruins because people were not worshiping God. They weren't coming to him. They weren't honoring him as God. His altar had become vacated and fallen into disrepair. And Elijah brings the people over, and he repairs the altar of God where people's sacrifices should be being offered. Verse 31, Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the, of the tribes, 
descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, "You shall your you your name shall be Israel." Wow, I messed that one up. Um, he said, "Your name shall be Israel." Then verse thirty-two: With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two silas of seed. He arranged the wood and cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it over the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said. And they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered. And they did it a third time. And water ran down the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah Step four. I want to pause here. I love how God makes it really clear that it didn't just happen by chance, that like maybe some, some fire flittered in from the sky, or maybe there was a forest fire, or someone was smoking, and all of a sudden, I mean, he has them drench it with water. The whole goal is for their altar and their sacrifice to light on fire, and he drenches everything in water because he wants them to see how extravagant God is. And we see this a lot God is extravagant. He doesn't just do barely enough. He brings an abundance so that it's unmistakably Him. He has them soak this thing so much that even the trench fills up. And then verse 36, At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that You are God in Israel and that I am Your servant, and have done all the things you command. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood and the stones and the soil, and it even licked up the water in the trench. Imagine that for a moment, the visual. Just this, this beam of fire shoots down from heaven and it's like, and everything's gone. I mean, undeniably could not have been anybody human doing that. Undeniably, no one could do that in their own human strength. Verse 39, when all the people saw this prostrate and they cried the Lord he is God the Lord he is God and Elijah commanded them seize the prophets of Baal don't let anyone get away and they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered them there okay hold on all right so Old Testament you killed the bad guys okay New Testament we don't we help them in love to find Jesus if this had happened in the, in the New Testament, they all would have repented of their foolish ways and come to Jesus, right? But here we see Elisha decisively having the prophets of Baal slaughtered. Verse 41, And Elijah said to Ahab, Go, eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. Remember, it had not rained in over three years, and the, 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 the country was so parched, there was so little water that the animals, the livestock, even of the king were dying and everyone was going far, far away for water and the, and the country was under this severe famine and people were in terrible, terrible suffering. And so as soon as God moves in power, the people fall prostrate and say, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. He says to Ahab, the king, the evil king of Israel, that a heavy rain is coming. Verse 42, So Ahab went off to eat and drink but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. There is nothing, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. Isn't it interesting? Go back. Go again. Go again. Keep going until finally something happens. Verse 44, the seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose, a heavy rain came on, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. Verse 46, the power of the Lord came upon Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab, remember, 
who's with a horse and chariot all the way to Jezreel. I love this scripture. I love this scripture. I love what God does to get his people's attention. I love what one person of courage and conviction and strength and, and commitment can do when God's in it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Um, we thank you that over and over again you prove yourself as a God for whom nothing is impossible. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would help us uh, in looking at this scripture to understand how it applies to our lives. And Lord, let us not lose sight of the wonder of this incredibly powerful act. But Lord, your word is not just some history book for us to ponder. It actually is your living word that instructs us and guides us and teaches us today. And we ask that as we look at it, that you would, would highlight to us by the power of the Holy Spirit what you want us to grab, what you want us to understand. That you would continue to be at work in us, that we would look more like Christ as we understand your truth in the Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. I think there's three things, three main things themes in this passage that we can catch that really um, communicate something powerful to us. The first one is this, that God wants to bring breakthrough and is able to bring breakthrough in your life. Do we have that as a core value? God is able to do anything and bring breakthrough in your life. The second one is this, we cannot live life divided between Jesus and the gods of this world. We cannot live torn. I cannot serve Jesus on Sunday, maybe even Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, but go after the gods of the world the rest of the week. It doesn't work. A person cannot serve two gods. They will always love one and hate the other. We cannot serve both God and money, both God and, and the, the gods of this world. The third thing is this. God calls us to great commitment in our relationship with Him if we're going to see the greater things. Now, anyone can, can accept Christ and say, I love Jesus, and that's going to be it, and their life will be very ho-hum, and will have no surprises, and will stay very comfortable, and they can go through life, and when they die, they'll go to heaven. I mean, that can happen. But what life will be like if we choose to go that way is it will look very much like a lot of people who don't know the Lord at all because we're not pursuing Him. We're just staying, we're just standing pat on the ground we've already taken. And it's easy to become complacent and to live in a life of compromise. God calls us to great commitment in our relationship. Let me ask you a question, and you can actually put a hand up if you want to. Have you ever felt God call you to do something that was very hard and potentially very rewarding, and you said no. Very hard and very rewarding, but you, but you said no for whatever reason. It was intimidating, it was scary, right? I remember when I first started praying for people that were sick or that were uh, affected by the demonic, or whatever, I would begin to do it by praying from about a block away and usually in my car. Because I knew that if it didn't work, I wouldn't be embarrassed. Or I wouldn't be, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't start a problem. So, so, I, so I would be, you know, I'd see someone like, you'd see someone, you know, down at the end of the street, you know, we had a, we had a guy over here one time who was, um, was a homeless guy and I think he was definitely had some mental things going on and he was sitting on the street corner and he'd yell and throw things in the street and so, Instead of going up to him, because I was intimidated, I would pray for him about a block away. Lord, heal him. You know what I mean? Because I didn't want to like, have him mad at me. And slowly I began to build up the courage to go up to people directly and said, hey, can I pray for you in this? Can I pray for you in that? But it took me a long time. There was a mission trip one time that I was invited on to many, many, many years ago before I was in ministry, and, um, and it was in a very hard place, you know, not a lot of, of, of nice accommodations, dirty, 
and, and some really bad conditions, and it was just too gross. And so I said no. Oftentimes, the best things take a bit of faith and risk. You know, if we know what the outcome is going to be, if we, if we know what the outcome is going to be before we do something, then it's not faith. It's just known. You know, and, and some of the biggest things in life involve great risk, involve great chance that we take, involve, involve us potentially getting embarrassed or being rejected, right? I remember the, the first time that I, uh, that I asked out my wife. I was very nervous. I thought she might say no but I thought that it was worth it. And so I took a step of faith, and I asked her, and something great came out of that. But if I would not have had the courage to ask her, that great thing never would have happened. And I think that our life with God, in many ways, is very similar. In many ways, it's very similar. It takes courage and boldness when we don't know the answer for sure, to create an opportunity for God to move. And that's when the most amazing things can happen. So we have Elijah here, and Elijah is a man whose, whose life is wanted. He's being persecuted. You know, they've been killing Ahab, the king of Israel, has been killing the prophets. They're all dead except for about um, well, a couple hundred that this guy Obadiah has hidden away in caves, but Elijah doesn't even know they're alive. He thinks they're all dead. And so, and so he's running for his life, and, and, uh, and God actually tells him to go to a place where there's a widow, um, and the widow's got a son, and he says, go to the widow, and I'll take care of you. So he goes, and he finds the widow, and the widow feeds him, and he keeps going, and um, the son at one point, you saw this in the video, the son at one point dies, and God brings him back to life through Elijah. Elijah prays for him, he comes back to life. And so he's, he's staying there with the widow, and, um, and God says to him, okay, now the time has come for you to go to Ahab. And I guarantee you the whole time he's been praying, God, I don't know what to do, but something's got to be better than this. And he's pressing in and pressing in and pressing in, and finally he gets his answer. And the first thing that we see him do when he gets up on the, on the mountain with the prophets of Baal, we see this in, in 1 Kings 18.21, he goes to the people and he says, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And it says, but the people said nothing. How many of us know that God does not like lukewarm Christianity? You ever, you ever been to Starbucks? Anybody here? Yeah. Brian actually is a manager at Starbucks. And really good hot coffee tastes great. Really good iced coffee tastes great. Has anyone ever had lukewarm coffee? It's been sitting there for about four hours. Try to drink that. That tastes really nasty. And that's really bad. It's like really, do you like that? You don't like that, do you? Okay. It's really bad coffee. You spit that out, you throw that away. And, and, and God, God, does, God wants us to be hot or cold for um, your word and this picture of your goodness and your power. And Lord, we ask that, um, that you would make all things clear to us. We ask that you would make all things clear to us. Lord, you call us to be a people of boldness and courage that are not afraid to take a stand for you. In our culture, in our lives, in our families. And Lord, let us be willing to walk by faith and be used by you like Elijah was to turn back a nation of people to worship of you. Lord, use us to transform the hearts of those that you've put in our lives. Lord God, that we would be on fire to a point where others would say, this is someone that I can get behind. This is someone that I can trust to lead well. This is someone that I want to emulate. 
And Lord, in all things, let us go to you for our breakthrough. Let us be known as a church of great faith, as individuals of great faith, because we know who the greatest power in the world is, and it's not the enemy. It's not financial success. It's not fame. It's not glory for our own self. It's, it's you. You're the greatest power. Holy Spirit, you are the one that overcomes. And Lord, through this word today, let us be bold and confident and convicted for your kingdom and your purposes. And Lord, may we always find our answers in you. With thankful hearts we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us spread the message. Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate. Thank you.